just ran and jumped in the cockpit. Just like that. Took off. You know who it was? You'll be killed. Somebody said it was Johnny Bowling. Johnny Bowling. Why didn't I watch my plane, lady? Why didn't you watch your kid? Well, he's standing here beside me just a minute ago. I turned my back for 30 Let's seconds. Let's not argue about it now. Isn't there anything we can do? Jack, get that fire extinguisher. Let's go. Any of your flights this way, Captain? I did cut it kind of close, didn't I? But for a good reason, though, Russ. Long distance phone call to a young lady. Lois? It's kind of extravagant, isn't it? I mean, you're going to see her in a few hours. Yeah, but this time I thought it might be nice if I married her. You're kidding. No. You think it's a bad idea? No, I think it's a great idea for you. What'd the lady say? Well, she said she'd give it some thought. Oh, that's a nice, clear cut answer. When do you find out what she means? Oh, I knew that before I called her. She means yes. Hi, Grace. Good afternoon, Captain. Hi, Big step, isn't it? What's that? It's always worried me, too. That's why I never did it. Wasn't even thinking about that. I'll bet you weren't. We've been talking about this for two years. Well, if you're going to get married, you might as well have a rich wife. She's not rich. Well, the way I hear it, she's got a fancy apartment. She may even buy this airline. Make me the captain. <laughs> Knock it off, will you? Well, can I say she's pretty? Yeah. She's pretty. Russ, take over for a minute, will you? Huh? Take over. Can I get you something, Captain? Let me see the passenger list. Thank you. Are we on schedule, Captain? Hmm. Yeah, routine flight. Are you enjoying your trip? Yes, I am. It's nice to have you with us again. <laughs> well, thank you, but I... 
I've never flown with you before. Are you sure? You see, this is my very first trip. Oh, well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Do you live in New York? No. Oh. I beg your pardon, but could you tell me who he is? The captain. Oh? Federal Airways 652. The Whitestone Bridge. Request landing instructions. Over. Federal Airways 652. This is Municipal Tower. You are clear to land. Make straight in approach. Use runway 37. Wind north 5. Municipal Tower. This is Federal Airways 652. Roger and out. Fasten your seat belts, please. We'll be landing shortly. What are you doing here? You're in the hospital, Mr. Bolin. You've been unconscious from a pretty bad rap on the head. How do you feel? I crashed. Don't let it worry you. You were the only one hurt. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be here. You won't be here long. It's just a routine examination. I couldn't get rid of them. They were on my tail. Two of them. Flames. Flames. The whole cockpit was full of flame. I was killed in that crash. I must have been. Why don't you lie down a minute? Dr. Bryant, please. He seems irrational, disturbed. Talks about flames being shot down, getting killed in a crash. 
Must have been a pilot in the war. All right. Thank you, Doctor. you call me that? Well, what is your name? Lieutenant Peter Stevens. What outfit are you with, Lieutenant? Red Hat Squadron. And uh, where are you stationed? Right here, alive. What kind of planes are you flying, Lieutenant? New ones. Spads. What day is it, Lieutenant? Why, it's... Wait a minute. How long have I been unconscious? A couple of hours. Monday, April 29th, 1918. Now, I got some questions I'd like to ask you. Well, just a minute, Lieutenant. There's someone outside who wants to see you. Miss Gordon? Oh, thank you. Now, uh, Miss Gordon, don't be surprised if he doesn't recognize you. What? I hope he'll know you, but he may not, so don't be upset. I'll explain later. You were the hospital. That's what I'm calling you about. I, I tried calling the hospital twice last night. They wouldn't tell me a thing. How is he? Well, I, I don't know yet, Russ. I'm on my way over there now. I wish I could go with you, but Hackett's got a different idea. That's right. I haven't thought of that. They'll have an investigation, won't they? In half an hour, the head office. Hackett's going to handle it himself. That's bad, isn't it? Good. Listen, will you let me know what happens? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll call you later at the hospital. He'll be fine. Thank you, Russ. Bye-bye. I've been to 407. Morning. Good morning. Routine question. What's your name? John Bolin. Routine answer. Good. Enjoy your breakfast? It was pretty routine, too. Lousy, huh? Yeah. Good. John, does the name Peter Stevens mean anything to you? No. Should it? Not necessarily. How about the name Lois Gordon? Where's Lois? She was here last night. She'll be back this morning. 
There's another name I have to ask you about. Joseph Hackett? Oh. Was anyone hurt in the crash? No, no one. You were the only casualty. But Hackett's holding an investigation this morning. Well, I'd better get down there. Well, not right now. Why? Well, for one thing, you had a severe contusion. And for another, when you came to last night, you were pretty disturbed. So I told him you would have to stay here for at least 24 hours. What did he say? He said, okay, I'll come there. Would have to be Hackett. Unfortunately, this investigation will have to be conducted in two parts. The hospital authorities, for reasons of their own, have refused to allow the captain of Flight 652, John Boland, to be with us at this time. However, his statement will be forthcoming later today. In the meantime, we'll simply have to proceed without him. I want to get this wrapped up before the CAA starts its investigation. I'll uh, take statements from each of you. I want to know what you saw from the tower, Mr. Weeks. Frank, I want your report of what I hope was an exhaustive mechanical investigation of the plane in question. Miss Hoyt, be prepared to tell me anything that happened inside that plane that might have some bearing on the accident. And you, Mr. Smith, have the double duty of reporting not only what you did inside the pilot's compartment, but on the actions and behavior of Captain Boland. If there's anybody in the world I want to tell, it's you. Then tell me. I can't. John. John, I, I think I have a right to know if you're in any kind of trouble. I may be in more trouble than you and I have ever dreamed of. You mean because of something that happened in the plane? Yes, because of something that happened in the plane. Then I hit him. I had to. And that's all you can tell me? That's it, Mr. Hackett. I took the controls. Well, it's obvious from the evidence, or rather lack of evidence, presented here this morning, that we can't arrive at the truth about the cause of the crash until I have the statement of the pilot. Therefore, this investigation will have to remain open. Uh, Mr. Hackett, I'm scheduled to go out on the 144 flight to Chicago. Do you want me to stick around? No, go ahead. If we need you, we'll get in touch. Dave, do you have any questions you want to ask anybody from the legal standpoint? No, I don't think so right now. I'd like to hear what the pilot says. Well, that'll be all. Thank you very much. Dave. Hi, Lois. Hi, Rod. Hi, buddy. Feeling better? Yeah, thanks for coming down. Well, I only got a minute. I've got to catch that Chicago flight. I just want to tell you that Hackett's headed this way with blood in his eye. That figures. What happened downtown? Well, uh, I'm afraid they've dumped the whole thing in your lap, John. What'd you tell them, Rod? Well, it wasn't much. But I had to tell him all I knew, including uh, how I had to belt you, John. I'm glad you were there to do it. Thanks. Get it. Look, I've got to run. I've seen enough of Mr. Hackett for one day. Russ, will you drop Lois at the Music Academy on your way to the airport? Sure. Sure, you don't want me to wait outside? No. It's better this way. You take your music lesson and call me when you get home. Good luck, darling. Looks like she said yes. I'll keep in touch. You're having a busy morning, John. Yeah. Good morning, Bolin. Sorry you weren't well enough to be with us downtown today. This is Mr. Anderson from our legal department. Captain Bowen. How do you do, sir? Now, let's make this as brief as possible. You were captain of our Flight 652 out of Chicago yesterday. Are you getting this? Yes, sir. According to the statements of the other members of the crew, from takeoff at Chicago until the tower at New York cleared you to land, the flight was completely routine and devoid of any unusual incidents, whatever. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Very well. Now, I want a statement from you covering everything that happened from that time until the plane was on the ground. Well, in accordance with my landing instructions from the tower, I made a straight in approach to set down on runway 37. The wind was north five. Airspeed was approximately 120 miles an hour. Well, go on. 
No. What do you mean, no? I mean, I'm not going to say anymore. But you just can't stop there. It's the end of my statement. Captain Bolin, your statement is the most important part of this investigation. Now, what happened in that plane? I don't know. You mean you blacked out? You were unconscious? I mean exactly what I said. I don't know. If you're trying to cover something, Bolin, you're being pretty foolish about it. We already have detailed reports from the tower, from your first officer, and from our chief engineer. We know there was nothing mechanically wrong with that plane. We know that Smith had to hit you and take the controls away from you. We know what happened on that plane. We're giving you a chance to tell us why it happened. I don't know. There's no one here against you, John. If there's anything at all you can add to the story, I think it'd be wise to tell it. I thought it would be easier this way. All right, Doctor. I expect an answer, Bolin, and I expect it now. All right, Mr. Hackett, this is what happened. I was trying to get away from two German fighter planes that were firing machine guns at me. Like my statement better now, Mr. Hackett? This is certainly a bad time to make jokes. This is no joke. I'm glad no one was hurt. And I'm eternally grateful that Russ Smith was there to land my plane for me. Because I couldn't. I had to do something else. Know what I did? I dove into a field in France and died there. serious than I thought it was. You think he's insane? That's a pretty strong word, Mr. Hackett. Well, what would you call it? Well, I'm not going to call it anything until I know a lot more about it. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to give it some kind of a name. We don't like to pin labels on these disorders. At this stage, it couldn't be arbitrary and misleading. Anyway, I couldn't give you a one-word description of what's wrong with him. Now, yeah, use as many words as you like, Doctor. I've got an investigation to clean up. Now, I have to know why, in spite of the airline's continuing tests and precautions, one of our senior pilots suddenly went insane in the middle of a flight. Well, I don't think he's insane. It's not that bad. Well, I have to go back to our board of directors and tell them something that'll make sense. Because they have to know just how much trouble the company is in with our stockholders and with the public. All right, Mr. Hackett. I understand your problem. Let me see what I can... what I can tell you. John Boland is a sick man. There's no doubt about that. You see, one of the characteristics of most neuroses is the tendency to escape reality. When this condition becomes severe or chronic, or when brain damage or deterioration makes it impossible for the patient to identify reality, then we call the resulting disorder a psychosis. And it's only in psychotic cases that we ever properly use the word insane. Don't you think Boland fits that description? I examined John Boland this morning, incompletely, I admit but I can assure you he's not a psychotic. What is he then? Well, he's suffering from some form of neurosis. But I don't know what kind or how severe it may be. He needs a thorough psychiatric examination and undoubtedly some form of treatment. At the moment, it's most important that he remain here under our care and observation.
Any time a patient experiences an hallucination, particularly if it's repeated, we can safely expect some degree of mental derangement. But the nature of the disorder may be severe and prolonged or extremely temporary. Well, I certainly did not. I'll notify the front door and all the other departments to watch out for him. Most important, that he not be allowed to leave the hospital. Well, we've got to get him back. Well, I want to get him back, too, Mr. Hackett. He's certainly in no condition to be wandering around the streets. Suppose the papers got hold of this, they'd laugh us out of business. Now, we've got to get him back, even if we have to call the police. Seems to me that would be the quickest way to get it in the papers. What would you charge him with? He hasn't broken any laws. Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. He's certainly wrapped up his career as a flyer. Baldwin will never work for Federal again or any other airline. I don't think that should be our primary concern right now. I'll try to find him. But we'll never get him back by hounding him or persecuting him. I'll get in touch with that girl he's going to marry. I'm sure she'll want to help. Our best chance is to get him to want to come back for the help he needs. All right, Dr. Bryant. I'm willing to leave the whole matter in your hands, at least for now. If you want to use our security police to help find him, I can arrange that. If he needs treatment, I'm sure our company will pick up the bill without question. If you need anything, let me know. But from now on, he's your patient and your responsibility. All right. I think that's the way to do it. John, be right back, Vern. I've got a client <laughs> out here. Well, Johnny, what'd you do, rob a bank? <laughs> now, Bob, I've got to get some information about a man who died in the First World War. What do you mean, a soldier? Yeah, flyer. What kind of information? Well, I want to give you some information, and I want you to tell me how to find out whether it's true or not. I don't follow you. Well, you must know some place to go to find out whether or not certain facts about a First World War pilot are true or not. Well, sure, there are public records. We can find out whatever we want to know from Washington. You know how to get at these records? Sure, I'll write a letter to the Veterans Administration. No, I need it now. Now? <laughs> you know how they work down there in Washington. Yeah, I know that it's slow and it's tough. That's why I've come to you. Sure, you must know a way to get through that log jam and get me some facts today. I suppose so. If it's important. Sure. Meet me at the office at three. But you don't understand. I need it now. You mean right this minute? Right this minute. Okay. Forget it, Vern. There's a phone here in the locker room. Got a piece of paper? You better write it all down. Robert Allen, get my office for me, will you, please? Betty, it's Mr. Allen. You'll find a number on Lloyd Paget, attorney, Washington, D.C. Put a call through to him right away. I'll wait. Paget can make a direct contact to the VA for us. Hey, where do I get in touch with you when I hear from him? My place? Oh, you better not. I'll be at Lois's. Call me there. First Lieutenant Peter Stevens, serial number 031592. What do you want to know about him? I want to know if there ever was such a person. Well, I told Mr. Hackett that just before I started to land yesterday, all of a sudden I was in the middle of a dog fight. Two German fighter planes were firing machine guns at me. You mean it was like a dream about the war? Yeah. Except it was the other war. The First World War. And that couldn't have been a dream. 
Yes, that was before I was born. What did Mr. Hackett think when you told him a thing like that? Mr. Hackett, with his usual sensitivity, thought I was making a joke. Certainly, Dr. Bryan, you'd better. The doctor knew I wasn't joking. When I came to in the hospital, I told him I was somebody else. Somebody else? What do you mean? Last night before you got there, I told Dr. Bryant that my name was Peter Stevens, a lieutenant in the Red Hat Squadron, flying a SPAD fighter plane over Valars, France. I told him it was Monday, April 29, 1918. I told him that I crashed and died there. John, why on earth would you tell him a thing like that? Because it was true. When I woke up this morning, I knew I was John Bolin, all right. But I also remember that suddenly, somehow on that plane, I stopped being John Bolin. Went back to another point in time, to another place, into another life, if such a thing is possible. For those few terrible moments in that plane, I was Peter Stevens. Oh, but John. That would be reincarnation. Yes, I suppose it would. Now you see why I had to get out of the hospital. I'd have told them the same thing I just told you. They'd have measured me for the cross-arm coat and put me in the room with a soft wall. Maybe you should have let them help you. Maybe I should. Hello? Yes, it is. This is Mr. Robert Allen's office. I have a message for Mr. John Bolin at this number. It's for you. It's Bob Allen's office. You take it. I'll take the message for Mr. Bolin. Wire received from Paget in Washington. Just a moment, please. All right. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yes, I have it. Thank you very much. Read it. Following items submitted to Military Personnel Record Center, Adjutant General's Department, First Lieutenant Peter Stevens, Army Air Corps, Serial Number 031592, Attached Red Hat Squadron, Killed in Action Monday, April the 29th, 1918, over Villars, France. All items confirmed. Let me see them. All items confirmed. Well, what do you think of that? Not quite sure what it means. It means that everything I told you is true. That I remember something out of another life. But reincarnation is impossible, I think, isn't it? Well, if this is reincarnation, what happened to me, then it's not impossible because it happened to me. I wish the answer had been no. There never was a Peter Stevens. Oh, darling, don't wish that. It would mean... Yeah. That I had a fit. I'm out of my mind. Well, maybe I could be cured of that. This way I have to live with the truth that nobody else will believe. You can't be cured of the truth. John. John, let's... Let's just try to figure out why this happened. Why yesterday? Why at all? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, did... Did anything like this ever happen before? No. Nothing. Wait a minute. Wow. You know my little joke about... I've been flying a plane since I was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not a joke, it's true. I know, dear. You told me the story. 
Now, for the first time, I understand how I was able to fly that plane. It was a World War I fighter plane, the same kind that Peter Stevens died in. Oh, for heaven's sake. Can you remember what happened that day when you were 12 that made you do what you did? I guess it was just because I saw the plane. It seemed so familiar, like I'd flown one before. So what about yesterday? Did you see one of those old planes again? No. Did anything unusual happen before you left Chicago or on the flight? I don't think so. Darling, did you see anything, anything that might have made this happen? It was just a routine flight. Oh, I left the controls once, and that was... There was a woman on that flight. A woman? Yeah, a middle-aged woman. I noticed her when I came aboard, and... Well, I thought I recognized her. Well, who was she? Well, that's just it. It bothered me so much that I got up to check the passenger list. She was sitting in 2B. The name didn't mean anything to me, but I had a feeling that it should have. She had a short name like uh, Jean or Dean or something like that. But do you really think a perfectly strange woman could have had anything to do with what happened? I don't know. But I couldn't get her out of my mind. It bothered me so much. As a matter of fact, I was still thinking about her just before I started to land. Then she may be the key to the whole thing. She might be at that. She certainly won't be hard to find. Call Russ Smith in Chicago. He can give me the information. Hello. Yeah, that's right. Hi. Hello. Hiya, buddy. How are you? You still in the hospital? No, I'm not. I want you to do something for me. Get the name and address of the passenger who was in 2B on our flight yesterday. Don't make me answer any questions. This is important. Don't ask any questions. Listen, I got a dozen of them. Well, all right, look, uh, seat, uh, seat 2B and... All right, I'll, I'll get it for you and I'll call you right back. Right, where are you? Oh, well, yeah, all right, sure, sure. Just a minute, hold on. Operator. Hello, operator. Look, will you hold this call from New York for a minute, please, and get me uh, uh, Central uh, 61099. Right, thank you. Darling, what will you do if you get her name and address? Well, I have to talk to her. You mean, call a, a strange woman on the telephone about a thing like this? No, I don't think I can call her. Probably have to go see her. All the way to Chicago? Lois, I can't let this thing alone. I've got to know more. This woman is the only lead I have. Yeah. Hey, John, uh, you're being pretty sneaky about this, aren't you? Uh, you know, I won't be able to face Lois, but uh, here it is anyway. Uh, Miss Jane Stone. Got it. Listen, I don't want you to think this was easy. You know, that silly girl down at the office, she thought it was me trying to date up one of our customers. <laughs> okay. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Right. Thanks, Russ. Well, I don't have to go to Chicago. The lady's name is Jane Stone. She lives on Fairmount Park Drive, Philadelphia. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from here by train. What are you going to say to her, John? I don't know. Figure that out when I get there. Well, I guess you have to go. Yeah, I'm sorry. When? Now. Oh. Will you be careful? Sure. You need any money? No, yeah, I'm all right. John. Hmm? Just one more thing. What? The answer is still yes. Gordon. Oh, Dr. Bryant, I thought for a minute it... Won't you come in? Thank you. 
Oh, I had quite a time finding you. I've never quite been able to follow this business of having a telephone number that doesn't appear in any public record. I'm sorry you had so much trouble. Well, don't apologize. I finally got your address from some mysterious source known only to Mr. Hackett. I felt it was most important that I see you at once, so I took a chance and came on over. I'm glad you did. It's nice to see you again. Won't you sit down? Miss Gordon, I must ask you, have you seen John any time since noon today? Yes. Yes, I have. Where is he now? He's on his way to Philadelphia. Is he still trying to run away? No. No, Doctor, quite the contrary. You're aware he ran away from the hospital? Well, I... I know he left without permission. But I can assure you that he didn't run away. Well, in any event, he's still my patient. And my responsibility to a greater extent than most patients, because in this case I've taken the added burden of answering to Mr. Hackett and Federal Airways. And... I must depend upon your cooperation. Dr. Bryant, I know what happened in the hospital and in the plane. But I know one very important thing that you haven't heard yet. Oh? John thinks he may be the reincarnation of Peter Stevens. That's too bad. Well, that was partly my fault, I mean, about calling it reincarnation. But that's why he left the hospital to find out if there ever was such a person as Peter Stevens. I understand. I was just hoping he hadn't gone that far. Everything he remembered about this man, the date he died, his serial number, everything, turned out to be absolutely true. Yes, I know. You know? Well, Miss Gordon, in a case of this kind, one of the first things I must do as a doctor is to find out whether or not my patient is identifying himself with an imaginary person or a real one. You mean this sort of thing has uh, happened before? Well, I brought this book over for you and John to look at. It's called Americans Over France. I thought it might help John realize how easily he could have known these facts and identified with this man. Peter Stevens. Well, for heaven's sake. Where did you get this? The New York Public Library. They have a very fine section on World War I. I don't think John ever saw this book. He had his lawyer call someone in Washington. Well, the book proves only that this information is easily available. If it appears here, it could have appeared in another book or a magazine or even the newspapers. I'm sure John's been interested in flying and flyers all his life. So it's reasonable to assume that he could have read this or heard about it from someone. And the facts remain tucked away in his subconscious mind, even though he forgot the source of the information. But if John still believes that, that he was this man in a previous life, what then? I don't think he will. But I must tell you frankly that that's where the danger lies. If John should become fixated on some such fanciful notion as this reincarnation theory, and runs around trying to prove it, then we could have a fairly serious case on our hands. What kind of a case? Well, let's face it honestly, Miss Gordon, this is not an uncommon form of delusion. We have institutions full of people who are convinced of something similar, although they usually think they're Cleopatra or Alexander the Great. Doctor, John went to Philadelphia to, to get some more proof. I'm sorry I didn't get here sooner. I could have saved him the trip. I wonder if I might see Miss Jane Stone. My name is John Boland from Federal Airways. Won't you come in, please? 
Will you wait right here? There's a gentleman to see you from Federal Airways, Miss Stone. Oh? Well, show him in, Daisy. This way, sir. Thank you. Good evening, Miss Stone. I'm sorry to break in on you like this. My name is John Bolin. I was a pilot on your flight from Chicago yesterday. Oh, yes, of course. I didn't recognize you at first without your uniform. Won't you sit down, Mr. Bolin? Thank you. First of all, I want to apologize for the unfortunate way that your first airplane flight ended. Well, I was only frightened for a minute. You see, I, I don't know how the landing of a plane is supposed to feel. So I suppose it was easier for me than for anyone else. Well, I can assure you it is not supposed to feel like that. When I spoke to you on the plane yesterday, it was because I thought I recognized you. Do you think that's possible? I'm sure we've never met before, if that's what you mean. Miss Thorne, I've come here tonight on a very unusual errand. I'm trying to solve a terrible puzzle. Strange as it may sound, you are the only lead I have. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. It's not an easy story to tell. I noticed you almost as soon as I came aboard the plane. My sense of recognition was so strong that, well, I worried about it during the whole flight. Because I couldn't place you. And then just before I started to land, and I remember clearly, I was still thinking about you and wondering where I had seen your face before. Very strange. And then suddenly it seemed that I was a different man. And not in our passenger plane at all. I was in a pursuit ship and fighting for my life. Machine guns were firing at me and the sky was full of planes. Fortunately for all of us, in reality, there was a co-pilot beside me who saw that I was in trouble and got the controls away from me in time to save our lives. But for me, there was no rescue. Bullets slammed into my engine and into me, and I went down in smoke and fire into blackness. When I regained consciousness in the hospital, for a while, I was not myself at all. I was still that other man with a name that John Bolin had never heard before. And it was because of this that I very nearly caused the death of 28 people, including you and me. This man whose name I thought was mine is dead. He died before I was born, but I know the day he died and the way he died. And because I have to know more, because I have no other smallest clue to follow, I've come here tonight to ask you just one question. Yesterday in the hospital, I told them that my name was Peter Stevens. Does that name mean anything to you? Will you please leave, young man, right now? Miss Stone, I meant no offense. Surely it's a simple enough question. It is a cruel and terrible question. I don't want to hear any more. You said quite enough. Please go. Now I know the name does mean something to you. Can't you please tell me what it is? I was engaged to marry Peter Stevens before he died in France. I loved him very deeply. I have lived with the memory of that love for over 30 years. Good night, Mr. Bond. Don't come back again. Not ever. You can find your own way out, I'm sure.
John. I would have waited up for you, but I didn't know what time you'd be back. Yeah, trains run pretty slow this time of night. You must be tired. I am a little. Can we talk for a while? I've got so much to tell you. Of course we can. I'll make some coffee. I think we should talk. I saw Jane Stone. What happened? I guess I made a terrible botch of it. She all but threw me out of her house. John, I was afraid of that. I just shouldn't have gone. Well, I'm glad I did. Jane Stone was the person to go to. Maybe the only person in the world who could help me. The only trouble is I handled it so badly. I don't know if I'll ever get to talk to her again or not. Well, I don't think you'll have to talk to her again. What do you mean by that? I have something to show you, darling. See? Right there. Where did you get this? Dr. Bryant brought it just after you left. It explains the whole thing. It does. I never saw this before in my life. Yes, I know, but you see, darling, the doctor explained it to me. If these facts about Peter Stevens are here in this book, they could have been in a book that you did read or, or a magazine article you forgot about reading, but it stayed in your subconscious mind. That's just dandy. Dr. Bryant comes in here and shows you something in a book and you decide that he's right and I'm wrong. Well, after all, he is a doctor. And he was able to explain the whole thing. He doesn't know the whole thing. And neither do you. What do you mean? I mean, before Jane Stone told me to get out of her house and never come back again, she also told me that she was the fiancé of Peter Stevens. She was? Yes, that's why she got so angry, because I stirred up a lot of uncomfortable memories. Are you sure? Am I sure about what? About any of these things. About what happened in Philadelphia, or what she really told you. Lois, what are you saying? Just a few hours ago, I told you a fantastic story. You understood what I believed and why I had to go see Jane Stone. Now, apparently, you don't care what I believe. You don't even think I'm telling you the truth. Could a doctor possibly have told you to make you change that much? I haven't changed, John. I love you. I'm trying to help you, just like I was before. The only difference is that the doctor told me how to help you, and, well, I'm not doing a very good job of it. Well, I'll tell you how you can help me. Go to Philadelphia tomorrow. See Jane Stone. Try to convince her to let me talk to her again. I can't do that. I wish you wouldn't ask me to. Honey, can't you see? Jane Stone is the living link to the life I lived before this one. All the answers, all the proof that we need are there. Not in a book or a musty old record, but in a living memory. That's the whole point. Dr. Bryant said trying to prove it is the most dangerous thing you can do. Fine. What does he want me to do? Go back to the hospital? Be sick? He wants to help you get well. And so do I. Well, I think I'm well now. And I guess that's what I'll have to prove first. Well, where are you going? back to Philadelphia. The proof is there, not at the hospital. But you can't go now. It's the middle of the night. Well, I can start now. Then I'll be ready to try Jane Stone again the first thing in the morning. Please, John, you can't go on like this. You're going to do something terrible to us. I think we are more important than any silly theory of reincarnation or, or anything else. Well, we're pretty important to me, too. We can't build much of a future on the suspicion that I may be crazy. Nobody thinks that. Not yet. But if I don't finish this job, I'm going to begin to think so myself. All right. Then you're not going to do it alone. I'll go to Philadelphia for you in the morning. You will? 
Yes. I will. Now, do you want some coffee, or will you try to get some sleep? No, no coffee. Just some sleep. I'll make a bargain with you. If you'll keep your promise and go to Philadelphia for me tomorrow, I'll go back to the hospital. I think that's wonderful. You know, I really think you ought to talk to Dr. Bryan. I'd like to talk to him. I guess I shouldn't be afraid to take my case to an expert. Oh, darling. We'll find the answers. And we'll find them together. I know one of the answers. When I saw Jane Stone on that plane, I knew her. And I'd never seen her before in my life. We have our discussion now. We'll do the tests and examinations that you want later. Well, John, if you treat a man for a sprained ankle and the ankle turns out to be broken, you not only can't give him intelligent treatment, but you may do him severe damage. All right, Doctor. Anything you say, I'll do. But just one thing. I've got an awful lot on my mind to talk about. I understand. This will take a few hours of your time, and then we'll talk. We'll talk as long as you want, and we'll do it today. Are you sure you won't have some tea, Miss Gordon? No, thank you. Miss Stone, I... I wonder if you can understand how reluctantly I undertook this visit. Well, you're certainly not here at my request. I allowed you to come here against my better judgment. And with the same reservation, I... I accept your apology in behalf of Mr. Boland. John is in need of psychiatric treatment, Miss Stone. He came here on a mission of his own, connected with a delusion that, that the doctor and I hope he can be cured of. He agreed to go back to the hospital, but we made a bargain, and I promised to come here and see you. Well, you have now fulfilled your promise. What further business do you have with me? John wants a chance to talk with you again. My dear Miss Gordon, until you are a great deal older than you are now, you won't be able to understand how badly I was hurt last night. I had no way of foreseeing what was in store for me when I received Mr. Boland. But after what I experienced last night, I would never willingly see him again under any circumstances. And is this your final word? It is. I guess there's nothing more for me to say. I must seem very unkind to you, Miss Gordon. I'm not an unkind person, really. I was badly hurt, and perhaps I was striking back. But I didn't mean to be unfair. He did seem such a nice young man. What... What is this delusion for which he's being treated? Well... John has come to believe that he is the reincarnation of Peter Stephens. The reincarnation of Peter? Yes, I'm afraid that's what he thinks. What a terrible thing. I'm glad I didn't understand that part of it last night. I'm afraid I might have been even ruder than I was. What's so terrible about it? I don't believe in reincarnation, Miss Gordon. Surely that's my right and my privilege. Yes, of course it is, but why do you feel so strongly about it? Perhaps because it is too frequently held out as a false hope to people in old age and bereavement. I, oh, I'd rather not talk about it. Well, 
John seems to think that you could prove this for him. Or disprove it. I could certainly disprove it. We shared many things, Peter Stevens and I, that no one in the whole world knew about. Things that even to this day I've never mentioned to a living soul. But, but you don't need me. Anyone can do that. But, Miss Stone, sometime today, John is going to learn the truth. And from one of the leading psychiatric experts in this country. But I know John. His convictions aren't easily explained away. The last thing he said to me before I came down here was, the truth is there with Jane Stone. Would you come to New York with me to talk to him? No, Miss Gordon. When you find that even the privacy of your innermost thoughts has been invaded, you feel that something peculiarly your own has been profaned. No, I won't go back with you. Then is there anybody else that was close to Peter Stevens that John could go to, to find out what he wants to know? No. No, I'm afraid not. There's no family, no one who was close to him. I'm the only one left. I'm very much in love with John Bolin. Does that mean anything to you? I hope he gets well, if that's what you mean. That's not what I mean at all. You were enough in love with Peter Stevens to live with his memory for all these years. Can you just flatly refuse to help another woman whose love is in jeopardy? That's a touching appeal, Miss Gordon. It's one thing to lose your love to a hero's grave, but it's something else entirely to lose your love when he's alive and strong. And needing only a few words. Just a few words to save his mind and, and to make him well. If I do go to New York with you, and if I do talk with your, your John, and prove to him forever that he is wrong in what he believes, aren't you afraid it might destroy him? Oh, no, quite the contrary. I think it would set him free. Very well. I'll go with you. Maybe I can save your love for you. And save the memory of mine for me. I believe is clear and simple. And impossible in the light of present medical knowledge. Excuse me. Yes? Oh, have them wait a couple more minutes, please. Now, to get back to the 12-year-old incident, I think the best explanation for that is in terms of the child prodigy. You were able to fly that spad when you were 12 for the same reason Mozart was able to compose a symphony when he was eight. Doctor, you have given me a separate and totally unrelated explanation for each one of the things we've discussed. But starting with reincarnation as a premise, I can give you one explanation for all of them, including how and why I happen to recognize Jane Stone on that plane. All right, John. I can do the same thing. The answer would lie in the field of extrasensory perception, more specifically in the phenomenon known as mental telepathy. Extensive research is being made in this field, but so far, comparatively few facts have been scientifically established, and that's why I've hesitated to apply it in this case. But a very plausible explanation of everything that's happened to you could be made in terms of mental telepathy. You mean I'm a mind reader? Well, not in the carnival sense, no. 
But I think it's reasonable to assume that Jane Stone, on her first airplane flight, might have had strong and emotionally charged recollections of the death of her fiancé. Exactly the kind of facts you later thought you remembered. Well, I didn't know she was thinking these things. And I certainly didn't try to read her mind. Well, there are indications that telepathic communication is possible without conscious effort of either party. Jane Stone could have held these thoughts, and you could have tuned them in or received them without trying. But why me? Why not somebody else on board? Well, maybe your thoughts were directed at you, John, because like Peter Stevens, you were the pilot. Well, that's pretty far-fetched, Doctor. Well, I didn't submit them as facts, but it is an explanation. Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to accept any explanation until I've had a chance to talk to Jane Stone again. You're going to have that chance right now. Can you send them in now, please? Yes, sir. She's on her way in with Lois. Hello, Miss Stone. Thanks, honey. I'm Dr. Brian, Miss Stone. How do you do? Please sit down. Well, I'm afraid I haven't been able to convince Dr. Bryant of anything. I tried. I took my case to the expert and fell flat on my face. It was wonderful of you to come, Miss Stone. I had the feeling that you were the kind of person who would help if you only knew how badly help was needed. When Miss Gordon told me that you believed yourself to be the reincarnation of Peter Stevens, the whole thing became a, a matter of deep personal concern to me. I completely reject the possibility of reincarnation as anything but an empty dream. And I particularly resent your choice of Peter Stevens as the subject of your belief. Please try to understand, Miss Stone. I didn't select Peter Stevens. If any choice is possible, a thing of this kind, Peter Stevens chose me. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. John, if you could just treat this thing as a matter of personal belief, it could never get you into trouble. Many of the things men believe in are unprovable in scientific terms. The danger for you, John, the seeds of sickness lie in your insistence on trying to prove your theory of reincarnation to me, to Lois, to Miss Stone, and to the world. But I've got to try to prove it. You're my doctor. Lois is the girl I'm going to marry. I don't care about proving it to the world. But some few people in the world have to believe with me, or I'll spend the rest of my life feeling like a freak. Dr. Bryant, when I came here with Miss Gordon, I believed that I was on an errand of mercy. Now I'm beginning to wonder whether I should have come at all. Most surely destroy his belief and end his chances of proving it. And your question is whether this would be good or bad for John? For any of us. Miss Stone, I don't know what the doctor's answer to this is going to be, but I can tell you what I believe. I'm sure that the proof I need is locked someplace in your memory and in mine. If I'm wrong, and if you can prove to me that I'm wrong, I'll still be deeply grateful. And I promise you that I will work with Dr. Bryant until I'm completely cured of Peter Stevens, and I can leave your memories alone. Well, uh, I can't help wondering, with personal as well as professional curiosity, how either of you think you could prove or disprove such a thing, short of the most extensive analysis and experiment. Doctor, I believe that Peter Stevens first came into my conscious memory when I saw Jane Stone on the plane. And I'm sure that there's much more hidden in my mind, just waiting to spring forth if I could only talk to her again without a wall of fear or, or antagonism between us. Mr. Bowman, there is nothing that I fear about anything that can happen here. And if there is any antagonism, it's, it's only a natural resentment at this intrusion in my privacy. I can think of only one way to prove to you that your belief is wrong. And that is to show you how pitifully little you really know about this man that I knew so well. All right. It's the only chance I have. Who was Peter Stevens' best friend? I don't know. Paul Carter. Does the name mean anything to you? No. It would to Peter Stevens. They were roommates at college. 
They went off to fight the war together. Would you describe Peter's mother to me? I wish I could. But you can't, can you? No, I can't. What was his hobby? He was a painter, Mr. Boland. A very good artist. Oh, I see no point in going on with this, do you, Dr. Bryant? Well, the results could hardly be called conclusive on the basis of just three questions. Uh, perhaps John would be more thoroughly convinced if you could ask him something about yourself, and Peter Stevens. Sometimes those memories are painful. Yes, I know, but I don't think we should leave any areas unexplored. It seems such a waste. Tell me about the moment when Peter asked me to marry him. The sun was shining. We were sitting on a grassy slope on the river bank. And there were people all around. There were racing shells in the water below. On the school kill. Yes. That's how it was. Regatta did. Can you tell me the song we sang together the night before he sailed? When Peter comes marching home again. Hurrah, hurrah. You shouldn't have asked me that. I didn't think you'd know. What is this, Miss Snow? What did Peter give me just before he went away? Oh, just a moment. Who else has seen this? No one alive has ever seen that but me. What do you want me to tell you? Describe it. It's a large gold brooch, circled with pearls. What else? It opens. It's a lock. There's an inscription. Can you tell me the inscription? To Jane, my love. Until I return. Peter. One thing, to me at least, it means that I was wrong. Something I believed impossible and foolish is not impossible at all. And if there's another explanation for it, Doctor, I don't want to hear it now or ever. Because now, finally, I can believe that Peter's soul was not destroyed with him and I feel in France. I'm glad I was wrong. I'm very grateful to all of you for what you've done for me today, but I... I don't think I should see any of you again. Goodbye, Lois. Goodbye, John. Bless you both. Dr. Bryant. Thank you. What a 
wonderful thing. Did you see the look on her face, Doctor? I wonder why she wanted to prove I was wrong. I think it was because she wanted so badly to believe that you were right. You know, I'm sure I could answer those other questions. If I could just find the people. But you can't, darling. Because she told me they're all dead. I think you should leave it alone now, for your sake and for hers. Don't try to talk to her about it again, will you? I don't have to talk to her again. I'm satisfied. What's your verdict, Doctor? About John? Well, the tests show that he's a normal, healthy guy. I'd sort of like to believe that... Well, that John and I wouldn't be living with a ghost. There aren't going to be any ghosts. You can be sure of that. My name is John Bowling. And I love you. I think you're safe enough on that score. My concern was the health of my patient and the serenity of his mind. I think he's all right on both counts. Just remember, people don't have to believe the same things or think the same way to be happy together. Mankind, even after all these years, has barely crossed the threshold. The only way we can continue to advance is to recognize that all human experience is part of the pathway to the truth. Mm -hmm.